Welcome to Pediatric Podcast for PedsCases.com. Welcome back to the Peds Cases Podcast on an approach to pediatric ECGs. This is part two of our two part series. My name is Eric King, and I'm a medical student at the University of Alberta. This podcast was developed with the help of pediatric hospitalist and medical educator, Dr. Karen Forbes, pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Joseph Atala, and the help of the Peds Cases team. Our objectives for this two part podcast series are to one, Outline a systematic approach to interpreting pediatric ECGs. Two, describe how the forces within the heart change and progress after birth. Three, recognize a normal pediatric ECG at different points in childhood and explain why differences are seen at different ages. And four, recognize common pediatric ECG abnormalities. In part one of the approach, we discuss the steps rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals, and we work through a case of a four-week-old boy with a new grade three systolic murmur. It's recommended that you listen to part one prior to moving on to part two. In this podcast, we will discuss the last two steps of the approach, voltages and repolarization. Since this is a visual topic, we encourage you to view the corresponding video presentation to this podcast available on the Peds Cases website. The sixth step is to evaluate the voltages of the heart, which can provide clues to whether there is abnormal ventricular mass or hypertrophy. Hypertrophy of the myocardium is one of the most common abnormalities seen in pediatric ECGs. It can result from anything that causes volume and or pressure overload in the heart and can impact the atria and the ventricles. Once again, referral to normative data is very important. We will look at voltages of both the atria and the ventricles. Let's first discuss the criteria for atrial hypertrophy. Right atrial hypertrophy is characterized by tall P waves, which are three millimeters or greater in any lead. It is most commonly seen as tall P waves in leads two, V1, and V2. The P wave represents atrial depolarization. So if we think about an impulse traveling from the SA node through the right atrium to the AV node, it makes sense that an enlarged right atrium would result in a taller P wave. Left atrial hypertrophy is characterized by prolonged P waves, which are 0.10 seconds or longer in any lead, or longer than 0.08 seconds in infants. Again, thinking about an impulse traveling from the SA node to the AV node, if the left atrium is enlarged, one can imagine that an impulse going through both atria will take longer to reach the AV node, resulting in a longer P wave. Broad notched P waves in the limb leads and a biphasic P wave in V1 with a dominant negative terminal segment may raise your suspicion for left atrial hypertrophy. Biatrial hypertrophy may also be seen and is characterized by a combination of an increased amplitude and duration of P waves. Let's go back to our case. The length and height of the P waves in leads 2, V1, and V2 are shown in the slides. The P waves are less than 3 mm in height and under 0.8 seconds long. There are no broad notched P waves and there are no biphasic waves in lead V1. Therefore, there is no atrial hypertrophy in our patient. Now moving on to the criteria for ventricular hypertrophy. Since a hypertrophy ventricle is larger and or thicker than normal, the forces within that ventricle are amplified. This causes the following key ECG findings. One, Large QRS complexes outside of the normal ranges in the precordial leads that reflect the hypertrophy ventricle. Two, an abnormal R to S wave ratio in the precordial leads that favor the hypertrophy ventricle. And three, QRS axis deviation towards the hypertrophy ventricle, mainly seen in right ventricular hypertrophy. When we evaluate the voltages or forces within the heart, it is necessary to understand which leads reflect the forces of the right and left ventricles. The forces of the right ventricle will be primarily represented by the positive R waves in right-sided precordial leads, V1, V2, and V4R, as well as limb leads 3 and AVR, while the forces of the left ventricle will be primarily represented by the positive R waves in the left-sided precordial leads, V5 and V6, and limb leads 1, 2, and AVL. A hypertrophied ventricle would show large R waves outside the upper limit of normal 
in the groups of leads that reflect that ventricle. It is therefore important to understand which leads reflect the forces of which ventricle. We can also compare the amplitude of the R and S waves in these leads to assess the relative forces of each ventricle. The S waves provide insight into the forces in the other ventricle, since the forces on the opposite side of the heart record as negative deflections. With this in mind, we can look at the R to S wave progression in the precordial leads as another way to assess the relative forces of the right and left ventricles, in addition to the axis. As we discussed in part one, the right ventricle is dominant at birth, and in the months to years following, there is a progressive shift to left ventricular dominance. If we look at lead V1, infants in the first months of life should have a high R to S wave ratio, where the R wave is greater than the S wave. This is because lead V1 reflects the right ventricle, which is dominant at this age. As the axis shifts, so too will the R to S wave ratio, and often by 2-3 to three years of age, the amplitude of the R and S waves are equal. After age 3, the ratio typically drops below 1, so that the R wave is now smaller than the S wave. The R to S wave ratios in lead V6 essentially show the opposite trend. Typically, the R to S wave ratios in lead V1 and V6 are used to assess for proper ventricular development. Let's look at the ventricular voltages to determine if hypertrophy is present in our case. The first major finding we look for are large QRS complexes outside of the normal ranges in the precordial leads that detect the hypertrophy ventricle. To do this, we will measure the R and S waves in leads V1 and V6 and compare them to normative data for age. As we just discussed, lead V1 represents the right ventricle and lead V6 represents the left ventricle. In our case, lead V1 shows an R wave of 16 mm and an S wave of 4 mm. These are both within normal limits for age. Lead V6 shows an R wave of 4 mm and an S wave of 1 mm, which is also within normal limits. Therefore, we can infer that as expected, the magnitude of forces in the right ventricle are higher than in the left, and all values are within normal ranges. The next major finding we look for in ventricular hypertrophy is an abnormal R to S wave ratio in the precordial leads that favor the hypertrophy ventricle. To do this, you measure the R and S waves, typically in V1 and V6, and then divide the R wave by the S wave to get a ratio. Based on the Rinbeek tables, the normal R to S wave ratio from 0 to 1 month in V1 is 0.8 to 3.7 and 1.0 to 3.7 in V6. Interestingly, in our patient, the R to S wave ratio in both leads V1 and V6 is 4 which is slightly above the upper limit of normal for age in both leads. This finding does not fulfill our criteria for ventricular hypertrophy, however, as the ratios do not favor a specific ventricle. In ventricular hypertrophy, we would expect the R to S wave ratio to be higher on the dominant side and lower on the non-dominant side. In our case, the R to S wave ratios are slightly high in both the right and left sided leads and are therefore non-specific to either ventricle. Finally, we look for QRS axis deviation towards the hypertrophy ventricle. We already measured the QRS axis in step 4 of our approach at plus 130 degrees, which was normal for our patient's age. If we suspected ventricular hypertrophy based on voltages or R to S wave ratios, we would expect an axis corresponding to that ventricle. So to conclude our findings, our patient has normal QRS complex voltages, slightly high but non-specific R to S wave ratios, and a QRS axis that is appropriate for his age. Although the R to S wave ratios are slightly abnormal, he does not meet criteria for ventricular hypertrophy. The last step in our approach is to look at the ST segment and the T wave for repolarization abnormalities. There are several ST and T wave changes in pediatric ECGs that are considered normal, but may be more alarming if they were seen in an adult ECG. Pathologic ST and T wave changes are less frequent in pediatric patients because ischemic heart disease and infarction are rare in this population. Nevertheless, certain ST and T wave changes may signify serious myocardial disease, so proper identification of these changes is important. The T wave is a recording of ventricular repolarization, and the amplitude and vector of the wave are important indicators of cardiac function. Because the axis of the heart starts to change drastically after birth, 
the axis of repolarization of the ventricles is also affected. The T waves in leads V1, V2, and V4R are typically upright from birth until day 7, where they flip and become inverted. They should remain inverted for the next 8 to 10 years. After these years of gradual access development, they then flip back and remain as upright T waves from then on. Positive T waves in leads V1, V2, and V4R from day 7 to 8 to 10 years old may suggest right ventricular hypertrophy. The normal ranges of the T wave axis and the T wave amplitude in leads V5 and V6 are available in the normative data. In general, the T wave axis should be the same or within 90 degrees of the QRS axis. The ST segment is the phase after ventricular depolarization and before repolarization. In healthy adult ECGs, this segment should return to baseline before the T wave. In pediatric ECGs, however, a slight elevation or depression of 1 mm in the limb leads and up to 2 mm in the precordial leads is common and within the normal limits. Detailed discussion of ST and T wave changes are beyond the scope of this podcast. However, some common pathologies that cause ST and T wave changes include myocarditis, pericarditis, left ventricular and or right ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomyopathy, digitalis effect, hypothyroidism, and although rare, myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction. Another normal ST variation in pediatric ECGs to be aware of is something called early repolarization. In early repolarization, leads with upright T waves have elevated ST segments, leads with negative T waves have depressed ST segments, and the T waves are taller than normal. It usually involves the inferior and lateral leads. You may also see a small positive deflection immediately following the QRS complex, which is called the J wave. Although it may look concerning, the ST segment shift is stable and is quite common in healthy adolescents. Let's complete our approach and look for repolarization abnormalities in our case. Recall that between 7 days to 8 to 10 years old, the T waves in the right side of precordial leads will be inverted. In our ECG, we can see that the T waves in V1 are negative, and all other T waves in the ECG are positive, which is expected. Looking through the ST segment for elevation or depression, we see that leads V2 and V3 show ST elevation of 1 mm. As we discussed, an ST elevation or depression of 1 to 2 mm in the precordial leads is normal. Therefore, there are no concerning findings in terms of repolarization in our patient. Now that we've gone through the ECG in detail, let's review our case. In summary, our patient was a four-week-old male with a new systolic murmur at the upper left sternal border. We interpreted his ECG by using the following approach. ID and calibration, rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, voltages, and repolarization. By working systematically, we determined that his ECG shows normal sinus rhythm at a rate of 167 beats per minute, a normal mean QRS axis of plus 130 degrees, no conduction disturbances, normal voltages, and no repolarization abnormalities. We can conclude that this is a normal ECG. With the reassurance from the ECG, our patient was followed clinically with regular checkups. The murmur was determined to be a benign systolic pulmonary flow murmur of infancy, as we suspected, and disappeared by six months of age. He remained asymptomatic from a cardiac perspective and continued to thrive. This concludes our Peds Cases podcast on an approach to pediatric ECGs. To review our learning objectives, we outlined a systematic approach to interpreting pediatric ECGs. We described how the forces within the heart change from right-sided dominance to left-sided dominance shortly after birth. We discussed what normal pediatric ECGs look like at different points in childhood and why these differences are seen. And with this approach, the viewer should now be able to recognize common abnormal pediatric ECGs. Becoming familiar with normal ECGs will allow you to more easily identify abnormal findings in pediatric ECGs. We recommend practicing this approach whenever the opportunity arises. Thank you for listening. Please refer to the self-assessment questions that are available on the PEDS Cases website. Check out www.pedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, 
questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store. Share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.